Welcome back. In this lecture, we will look at some specific examples of power cycles. In the earlier lecture, we had introduced power cycles. We had started with gas power cycles. The working fluid doesn't undergo any phase transformation. It remains always in the gas phase. All the discussion on power cycles has its fundamental basis in Carnot analysis. The Carnot analysis is special, it's reversible. The working fluid also undergoes a thermodynamic cycle. We analyze this extensively and we can also devise ways to realize a Carnot cycle. This is what we saw in the last lecture. Based on this, we can generalize the working of power cycles into various categories and we have started discussing gas power cycle. We differentiated between external and internal combustion engine. So in this case, for example, you have to supply heat, but the heat that is being supplied is generated elsewhere and you supply heat and you are rejecting heat um, in some parts of the uh, process flow sheet. So um, in this process of realizing a steady state flow Carnot cycle, compression occurs in this section and uh, expansion occurs in this section and externally generated heat is being supplied. But in many rear engines, like for example, in the internal combustion engine, there is air and fuel being combusted within the system and the heat that is generated within the system is added to the system. Okay, so this is harder to analyze. This is a flow system with inlet and outlet of uh, reactants and products. Combusted products is uh, brought out of the system. We typically use numerical methods um, and computer simulation to analyze internal combustion engine, but to facilitate a reasonably simple analysis, we adopt uh, uh, certain approximations called this standard air, air standard analysis where we do not look at inlet and outlet of uh, reactants and products, but we only look at a closed system. And then we assume that there is a finite amount of um, air that is being circulated, that air is in the form of an ideal gas and so on. So we did all these things in the previous lecture. All these things were, are going to be used for analyzing variety of reciprocating machines. We introduce what is the reciprocating machines that are various terminologies and it's important to correlate the movement of the piston to the four segments of uh, operation of a recipro reciprocating engine, which is um, the acronym I used was ICP, corresponding to the intake uh, phase. There's a compression phase and the work is generated in the power stroke. And then there is an exhaust phase. So we introduce uh, these um, four segments of the operation of a reciprocating engine and the power stroke determines the work that is uh, generated. So there are two broad class of reciprocating engines. This is here in this engine, the combustion is initiated by a spark plug, but there is also another class called compression ignited reciprocating engine. So we will look at these and look at quantitatively how to analyze these kinds of engines. So there is two different kinds of uh, auto cycle. Auto cycle corresponds to spark ignit uh, ignited uh, reciprocating engine. There's a four stroke cycle and a two stroke cycle. In a four stroke cycle uh, for one cycle, okay, so there is what is being a cycle. The mechanical position of a piston is uh, you're keeping track of that and the system is brought back to its original position. That is, you start from here and then there are four strokes and then you come back to this point. Uh, the piston is also at that point. Um, 
and also the all um the gases that came in uh, have reacted and have been taken out of the system okay so that's when you finish a cycle even though the working fluid doesn't undergo a thermodynamic cycle effectively the system has come to the original position okay so in a four stroke cycle to when you complete one cycle uh, the piston has undergone four strokes okay so this is one stroke and this another stroke and so on okay there are four strokes uh, undertaken by the piston and the crankshaft uh, this has uh, undergone two rotations in a four stroke cycle however uh, a simpler cycle where uh, three uh, things have uh, there is three of the parts have been integrated into one stroke and there is another stroke uh that's uh, that's what a two stroke engine is okay in in one cycle there are two strokes and one revolution of the uh crank shaft okay, so this is a simple two stroke engine air and fuel uh mixture is uh brought in and there is a port for uh exhaust of the uh, combusted products okay so for example you can see the operation of a uh the in a descriptive manner we are showing the operation of a two stroke engine okay there is uh some gas air and fuel uh mixture is brought in and then um the moment of this a uh, piston closes and opens this exhaust port also and there is transfer of this via this means there is this intake port uh so the two stroke engine is less efficient but uh, less sophisticated than a four stroke engine um it is used in certain uh, simple devices even motor bikes and uh, lawn mowers and so on uh, your book gives you great example where uh, both of these things are utilized in trucks and cars and so on the typical four stroke engine is being utilized but both fall under uh, an auto cycle so if you look at uh, operation of a four stroke engine let us start from here you are slightly below the atmospheric pressure there is this intake stroke so what happens in an intake stroke uh this valve is opened up which also lets in the air fuel mixture this piston goes down so the volume increases and the piston moves from the stopped dead center to bottom dead center so it goes in this direction the volume increases so so you are in this cycle and then there is ignition there is okay the ne next part after completing this intake stroke you go to the compression stroke okay so you are in this leg okay so here the intake valve is closed and then you are the compression leg so this is uh, the piston goes up the volume goes down and then the spark is uh, um, there is an ignition at uh, some point uh, because the number of moles of the products that is generated is greater and the temperature also increases the pressure increases dramatically all these things are occurring in the expansion phase okay this is this power stroke okay so the um, again the volume increases um, at some point the exhaust valve opens up this exhaust valve that is opening up um, and then the products of combustion is taken out of the system uh, the along this while this piston is moving the piston is attached to the crankshaft and there are rotations of the crank machinery uh, and then the volume decreases you are along this leg uh, the inlet valve opens and then the cycle repeats okay from here you go here from here you go here and so on okay so this is a uh, a four stroke engine so if you want to use the analysis which we have developed in the many lectures of a flow system you can look at the uh, apply first law apply enthalpy balance and so on okay typically uh, you do not analyze a flow system here okay you do not take into account the inlet and 
outlet of inlet of reactants and uh, oxidant and the outlet of combusted products you look at an equivalent closed system so as much more easier to analysis and then you ask certain questions that are determinant of efficiency of the engines so the equivalent um, a closed system analysis is shown here um corresponding to the moment of piston there are certain changes there can be isoentropic compression uh, between 1 to 2 uh, things so there is isoentropic compression there is no heat exchange at this point then there is heat addition okay so that corresponds to the heat generated here right so uh, because of combustion here we think there is some external uh combustion is occurring in some external means uh, external chamber the only the heat that is being generated is being transferred there is no uh, inlet fuel or anything okay so uh, if you look at uh, the working mixture working fluid it is just air that to approximate it as an ideal air mixture okay um so here there is air fuel mixture that is not being taken into account everything is uh just air ideal gas condition and cp and cv are at ambient temperature it's called uh, cold air analysis so when you supply this um heat to the system you go from 2 to 3 so the pressure increases um but under constant volume okay so that's an approximation okay so uh, that facilitates analysis so you heat is supplied to the system and there is isoentropic expansion from 3 to 4 where work is being done and then there is a heat rejection which brings uh the system back to the original point when you go from 4 to 1 okay so you have completed a cycle in this manner and then the question you ask is out of this heat that is being supplied how much of work that has been generated okay that's the question of efficiency that's the question you try to ask so this is an ideal auto cycle it's a closed system can be analyzed with the equations which we have developed in the uh, many le lectures um so what about the two other strokes so here we talked about uh, two strokes only right so it goes up and the piston goes down so that's a two stroke what about the two stroke corresponding to this part of the cycle there are two more strokes actually these two strokes can be approximated by in this man okay so by these two uh, motions okay these two strokes there is an intake stroke and then there is a final fourth stroke and if you ask what is the work interaction corresponding to these two strokes if you represent these two strokes in this manner there is an intake stroke and the final exhaust stroke the work interaction involves p not because that's a constant pressure and then there is a increase and decrease of volume the same increase and decrease of volume so actually there is this work in one stroke cancels for the work in the other stroke is exactly the opposite Okay, so effectively to ask the questions of efficiency, this work interaction um, in the first stroke and the last stroke, okay, is one and exactly one and the same. They cancel off, uh, so you need not take into account such uh, work interactions. We are going to only look at the heat and work interaction in this cycle. All right. So how do you analyze uh, an auto cycle? this is fairly straightforward because this is a closed cycle and then we have already established the kind of equations the kind of equation that are relevant for this system so let's look at it closely so let's start with what happens when you go from 2 to 3 right so here in 2 to 3 so let's move from this uh, let's look at 
both these graphs together. The, both these graphs are used for um, describing what is happening in your cycle. So two to three corresponds to an isochoric process, right? Look, this is x-axis, this is volume here. It is an isochoric process. So, and corresponding to this, the temperature also changes from two to three. So this graph helps you look at temperature changes, of course, color entropy changes also. This tells you the PV changes. So it's important to look at both of them together. It's an isochoric process with corresponding temperature change. So that heat input can be um, represented as specific heat capacity at constant volume times the temperature change. Likewise, the heat output is in the process four to one. Four to one, again, is an isochoric process, constant volume, heat is being rejected with corresponding temperature changes. Once you know the heat that is taken in and rejected out, we can define the efficiency because from first law balance, we know what is the work that is being generated divided by the overall heat input. This is a simple manipulation. And we also know that changes one to two and three to four are isoentropic uh, changes. We have analyzed isoentropic ideal gas results extensively. We are going to use those results to simplify further and introduce new terms. You can relate the different temperatures and uh, volumes using the isoentropic gas results. This K is the ratio of Cp by Cb. We have done this analysis extensively in the first half of the semester. So you are going to uh, use such results to uh, define a new term called compression ratio, which is the ratio maximum volume, the piston um, in uh, BDC by TDC, uh, that is the compression ratio. We'll see why we are introducing that. Using that, we can rewrite the efficiency, theoretical efficiency of an auto engine in the following manner. One minus R compression ratio, K minus K is Cp by Cb. K minus one. What have we achieved in this analysis by We've made a series of approximation, a closed cycle, air standard analysis, all these things with such approximation, what you can see is that the theoretical efficiency of an auto cycle increases with increase in compression ratio, right? If R is a um, larger number, okay, so that the compression ratio is larger, we can tell how the efficiency of an auto cycle increases. Okay, so that is the most important thing, right? So if you plot uh, this in this graph, if you as you increase the compression ratio, uh, your efficiency increases. Okay, so that is the essence of this analysis. After making all this approximation, it gives you a simple guideline on the primary determinant of the efficiency of an auto cycle, right? So, and we can also plot as a function of uh, K, K is the Cp by Cb, uh, and then you can look at the efficiencies. So, if you want to keep increasing your efficiency, you know that you have to increase your compression ratio. But what is uh, a constraint here? You might have heard about this engine knocking, right? So when you compress, there is a possibility of auto ignition just because of increase in temperature. Whenever you are incre um, decreasing the volume, your temperature also increases, right? Um, because of it, there is a possibility of auto ignition and engine knocking, okay? So this, the octane uh, number, CTA number, all these things are related with your engine knocking properties. Um, uh, some 
descriptive aspect of uh, this analysis also available in your textbook so you should take a look at that um, so the main thing is that uh, the compression ratio cannot be increased indefinitely because you are going to hit the constraints of auto ignition and engine knock so this motivates you uh, just note okay so here the ignition is supposed to occur via a spark plug Okay, so you are not supposed to get out the, the fuel and air is not supposed to get ignited by chest compression, right? So, all right, to eliminate these issues of uh, auto ignition, uh, this is what is, uh, happens in a gasoline fuel. There is another kind of engine, which is the diesel engine where uh, in this uh, regime, while you're compressing, there's only air, okay, in your chamber. And as you compress, there's no spark plug, the temperature increases and fuel is injected. The, when the fuel is injected, the temperature is sufficiently high. Therefore, the engine, uh, uh, the combustion pro, uh, mixture auto Okay, so you eliminate a um, compression of an air fuel mixture, and here mainly it is uh, air that is being compressed, and to the air is being compressed to sufficiently high temperature, such that when the fuel is injected, there is combustion uh, is initiated. Okay, so that's the central feature of. Uh, a diesel engine. It's a combustion ignited engine as opposed to a gasoline engine, which is a spark ignited engine. So uh, there are lots of advantages of uh, a diesel engine. The fuels are cheaper, less pure, and so on. The knocking issues are lesser in a diesel engine, but it also has disadvantages. Okay, the, uh, the power that is ultimately that can be generated in a diesel engine is lesser but uh, lots of research is going into improving a diesel engine and its use is, uh, is increased uh, because of fuel efficiency and fuel cost. How do you analyze uh, a diesel engine? Again, you plot the four steps, uh, one, two, three, four, in the two diagrams, right? In the PV diagram and the TS diagram. The TS diagram gives information about the temperature changes. The PV diagram tells you about uh, changes in pressure and changes in volume. Okay, so for example, if you look at how much of heat is being input into the system that occurs in this phase of the engine, right? When you go from two to three. To analyze that, you apply first law balance this is the boundary work, right? So the boundary work corresponds to work that is being done at constant pressure as the volume changes from this point to this point, right? So this is uh, this is corresponds to boundary work. This corresponds to heat input. This corresponds to internal energy change. It's just the application of the first law. And the boundary work can be represented as P2 times V3 minus V2. Uh, just applying uh, the first law balance here, both these things can be combined as the enthalpy change as you go from two to three. Because it's a constant pressure process, you can use this formula, heat capacity at constant pressure. As you go from two to three, uh, your temperature also changes from uh, T2 to T3. Okay, so I can apply this heat balance. Likewise, we can analyze the changes when you go from four to one, because that's where there's heat rejection. And four to one is an isochoric process in a diesel engine. So I can use the heat capacity at constant volume and corresponding changes in temperature. Once I know the heat input and heat rejection, I can define the efficiencies. Right? So just from first law of balance, I can define the efficiency like what we did in auto analysis. Similar 
isotropic gases can be utilized. Just that you introduce a, a new term. Uh, you will see why you introduce a new term. RC, critical compression ratio, which is V3 divided by V2. And you can rearrange your efficiency result in this following manner. If you contrast the efficiency, theoretical efficiency of a diesel engine against the theoretical efficiency of an auto engine, this is the formula you had for auto engine. This is the efficiency formula for a diesel engine. So RC is a positive number, right? It's V3 divided by V2, V3 divided by V2, right? So it's a number greater than one. Therefore, you would see that the efficiency of a diesel engine is always less than that of an auto engine. Auto engine is more efficient than a diesel engine. You can plot the theoretical efficiency of a diesel engine as a function of RC2. Okay, RC is this, this quantity. As you vary, uh, the diesel, as you increase RC, uh, the efficiency changes, right? So, so this kind of analysis is possible because of the simplifications we have made, okay? We have simplified a flow system into a closed system, and then we have approximated certain parts of the cycle as being done at constant pressure and done at constant volume to obtain a simple expression for theoretical efficiency of a diesel engine as a function of compression ratio and as a function of RC and as a function of K. K is CP by CB, right? So that's a very powerful conclusion uh, which we are able to get because of the approximations that have been made. We, we will move on to another cycle that is uh, uh, commonly being increasingly used. The reason, um, the basis for this cycle is what you had seen in the past, right? In the past, what did you see? There is a combustion of fuels and heat is being generated and combusted uh, products are being sent to a turbine and expansion occurs in this turbine and there is exhaust gas is sent out and then there's fresh air that is being sent in. Compression occurs in this uh, compressor. The compressed air is sent into this combustion chamber and so on, right? So we had already seen this and we had utilized the isoentropic approximation to analyze this part and this part, uh, especially in when we dealt with exergy analysis, right? Motivated by this process that occurs in uh, 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 real systems, okay? This itself is that to analyze this, we had used certain class of approximation, but motivated by this system, there is a simplified version of this process, okay? This version of this cycle, this, uh, which is called the Brayton cycle. In the Brayton cycle, the heat is input at constant pressure into a heat exchanger and the working fluid is circulated around. Okay, so heat is input at constant pressure via heat exchanger and the working fluid is heated up in this stage. And that is being supplied to a turbine. Work is being generated and the working fluid is, is expanded and sent to a heat exchanger and operating at constant pressure where the heat is being rejected out. Okay, so And then the working fluid is sent to a compressor. It is compressed and then sent back to a heat exchanger. This is at a high temperature, this is at a low temperature, but both are at constant pressure. So if you look at, let's say one, two, okay? This is an isotropic compression. 
occurring in a compressor, but this is the working fluid, which is entirely circulated. Here, only the fresh air is being compressed. In two, three, constant pressure heat addition. This is the different, these two are uh, different. Uh, so instead of combustion occurring here, the combustion occurs elsewhere, and that heat is being sent, uh, is being transferred to the working fluid. Then there is three force, again, isentropic expansion. Uh, expansion occurs here too, but uh, along with that, there is the exhaust gas is sent out, but no such thing occurs here. And then there's constant pressure heat rejection. This is called a Brayton cycle. This was analyzed in the context of nuclear energy and so on, but uh, not widely practiced, but with uh, the change in energy scenario, uh, renewable energy and so on, Brayton cycle is being uh, re-looked at um, more closely. The emphasis of Brayton cycle is being increased. How do you analyze Brayton cycle? Again, you first plot the four parts of the cycle in the PV diagram and the TS diagram and then apply the first law of balance. Uh, we know because there's a working fluid that is input uh, uh, stream that is moving around. So therefore, you introduce the first law of balance via enthalpy. For example, <coughs> heat input is in the stages two to three, right? The heat input stage two to three is a constant pressure process. Therefore, you can use the heat capacity at constant pressure and corresponding temperature change to account for the enthalpy change. Likewise, the heat rejection can also be accounted using a constant pressure process. Once you know the heat input and heat output, you will know the efficiency of a Brayton cycle. I can use the isotropic gas results for representing one process change one, two, and three, four. Using those results, I can rewrite the efficiency using new variables. I, I introduce this new term, Rp, which is P2 divided by P1, right? What is the pressure at this point divided by the pressure at this point? Corresponding to these two points, there's also temperature changes, okay? So if you want to um, look at the efficiency results, introduce all these terms and the results of isentropic gas results, you, the theoretical efficiency of a Brayton cycle can be represented in this manner. If you want to have greater efficiency, you want to have greater pressure ratios. As you increase the pressure ratio, your efficiency increases. Also, that's a function of K okay, as usual. Um, but if the kinds of question you try to ask is, yeah, it is clear that the pressure ratio, if increased, increases the efficiency of the Brayton cycle. But can I indefinitely increase the uh, pressure ratio? That's where the material constraints come into picture, right? As you increase the pressure ratio, the temperature changes also increases, right? So, uh, the, the material properties of the turbine uh, are the limiting constraints in operating at higher and higher temperature. As you operate at higher and higher temperatures, the material degradation corrosion increases. So you, you cannot keep increasing the pressure ratio indefinitely because the corresponding higher temperatures also degrade the material, okay? So in any case, a simple closed system analysis of a Brayton cycle gives you a lot of insight into the th determinants of efficiency of a Brayton cycle. A cycle that we are not discussing extensively uh, in this uh, course, uh, it is beyond the scope of this course, is uh, what's called the Stirling engine. Its importance has 
increased significantly with uh, concentrated solar power. So what do you have? This uh, There is a solar concentrator. All the heat is being concentrated uh, into this part. And then you operate what is called a Stirling engine. Okay, This is a high temperature uh, region, uh, which helps you. Uh, there is a uh, operate a cycle uh, work generating device and the fluid is being internally circulated. This is a solar powered Stirling engine. We are not analyzing this because within, this is not within the scope of this uh, course. However, if you are interested in some, in all these power cycles, there are uh, more than one advanced courses in mechanical engineering. This is a one of the mainstream uh, topic in mechanical engineering, how to analyze uh, more and more advanced power cycle devices. So if you're interested in these kinds of aspects, you should go and take uh, open electives that are offered uh, in the mechanical engineering department, uh, where they deal with these kinds of power cycles in, in much greater detail. So in the next lecture, we will go into power cycles called vapor power cycles. Here, uh, it's not a gas. So the working fluid undergoes uh, phase transition. We will see how to analyze that in the next lecture. With that, I'll stop here. Thank you.